Hello, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to tell you, they, they asked me to tell you um, my thoughts on the causes of the extreme beliefs that QAnon followers developed. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. But before I do, I would like to change a slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you going to be doing that? No, no, no. Don't Yes. I would like to ask you a question, just to contemplate for a second. How much of what we think is our reality is actually completely subjective and instead is based on a mutually agreed upon illusion? Just think for a second, how much of it? Do you think it's 5%, 10%, 50%? Okay. I am here to suggest to you that it's most of it. I know this is a radical idea, but that's what we're here for, right? So I'm here to try to get your agreement on the fact that what is beautiful or ugly is completely dependent on our mutual agreement, right? What is valuable or garbage is also completely subjective. More to the point, what is worth suffering for or dying for? If this is intuitive to you, doesn't mean it is to everyone. If this is ridiculous to you, doesn't mean it is to everyone, right? How about what's worth killing for? Knowledge, this is Giordano Bruno who was killed for his ideas about distant stars being just like our sun. That's what he was killed for, completely normal right then and there. Maybe it's somebody's religion that it's worth killing for. Maybe it's their ethnicity. This is a picture from the um, um, famine that Russia instituted against Ukraine in the 1930s. Six to eight million dead because they're Ukra Ukrainians. What is an appropriate sexual object? This is a picture of a, um, an Afghani dancing boy who are basically children prostitutes. Picture of a child marriage seems crazy to us, but completely normal somewhere else. Subjective reality, mutually agreed upon illusion. In our reality, we drive on the right side of the road because we agreed to do so. What if even 10% of our population decided not to play along and drive on the wrong side, or what we think is the wrong side? We exchange pieces of paper, and we work for them, and we kill for them, because we agreed that they have value when in reality, they're actually just pieces of paper. We decided that we can't just kill people, that a life, any life, is really valuable. Even if somebody's really annoying, we decided we can't kill them. Even if they challenge our mutually agreed upon illusion, we decided we can't crucify them. That's just not okay. We decided in our reality at one point in time that love between two consenting, consenting adults is the only appropriate reason to, to have a sexual relationship with somebody. Wasn't the case everywhere, um, wasn't the case at all times, and it's still not the case right now in some parts of the world. But for us, this reality is as solid as the floor I'm standing on. Speaking of which, this room we're here today is what? Like a classroom, auditorium? And we're at a university? And we're like scholars, right? And we're here exchanging knowledge. All of those meanings are really important to us. But consider for a second that they're very easy to dismantle. Imagine that a neighboring country, or not so neighboring country, would come with arms and take over this country and overrun the university and storm this room and take us all hostage and turn this into a torture chamber and inflict unimaginable pain and suffering and humiliation on all of us and defecate on every surface, which is what Russian soldiers like to do. And not just for the lack of toilets, but because this is a symbolic act of defiling are shared illusions. I ask you, would this still be 
an auditorium? Would this still be a university? Would we all still feel like we're scholars? Would we all be exchanging knowledge? I put it to you that even if this room was cleared of the soldiers and the blood and the feces, it would take a lot to bring it back to the meaning that it has right now. So when you strip all the layers of mutually agreed upon meanings, all the layers of cultural patina underneath all these illusions that people like Russian soldiers can take away, what's left of our reality? Pain, pleasure, and the starry heavens above us. And I want you to think about it for a second and just see if you can take a measure of your emotions and the state that you're in when you're con contemplating this that most of what we take as solid facts are in fact subjective. They're a result of a large number of people agreeing with these facts. How does it sit with you that there is no certainty in this world beyond pain, pleasure, and the starry heavens? And if you would, I would ask you to take an internal snapshot of your mental state at this moment as you're contemplating it, because I'll be referring to it later in this talk. So we created a collective reality where, through the process of acculturation and socialization, we emphasize these collectively agreed upon illusions, we perceptually solidify them. We put plaques on the doors and names on the gates to identify to us and everybody else that this is a university and this is an auditorium, and we invest real sweat and real work into this meeting, everyone here sacrificed a lot to be in this room, to have the knowledge that we're sharing here. So we imbue these meanings with real sacrifice. And it is the way of these subjective realities that they work as long as we sacrifice for them. So when two people love each other, that is a reality because they become each other's source of pain and pleasure. But when we put an expensive ring on the finger, when we, you know, pay for a wedding with hundreds of people, that becomes a collective myth that we call a marriage. And it's paid for in real pain. We also collectively obfuscate just how elusive the reality behind our illusion actually is. We write laws that draw imaginary lines that separate good from bad, and we put as Americans like to say, good guys with guns in charge of guarding these laws. And these good guys with guns can inflict real pain and suffering on those people who cross these imaginary boundaries that we created. We put people in charge, giving them authority over the pain and pleasure in the forms of laws and guns and money by collectively agreeing to respect their authority. Our culture, our reality, is possible because most of us agree on some subjective things and because most of us tend to forget most of the time just how subjective everything is. But what if a sizable minority of our population stops playing along? What if they decide that those we put in charge are actually not an authority and they're not gonna respect them? What if they decide to disregard our laws or use guns of their own against our good guys with guns? What if they decide that some human lives are not worth much at all because these are not actually humans? Maybe they're cockroaches, or maybe they're Ukrainians, or maybe they're human-lizard hybrids, and so should be killed. What if they decided that the knowledge that we here in this room hold so dear is worth absolutely nothing and they even put their mouth where their mouth is and drink bleach instead of the pharmaceuticals that our science produces because they disregard our science. In other words, what if QAnon? This was a really broad intro, but I think it's very important to keep this perspective, this cosmic perspective, on the phenomenon that is QAnon. So I will tell you why and how the reality we all 
believe in and live in mo most of the time began to crumble for a sizable segment of the American public, and why QAnon became a magnet for them that offered an alternative that they were seeking. Um, I will tell you about what these people are like a little bit and uh, about the ripple effects that their beliefs have on the larger society, including us. But I'd like you to keep in perspective that the data points I will present today are only snapshots of a much greater issue that needs to be considered if we would like to maintain our shared illusions, including who gets to decide what's right and wrong and which lives are worthy and which lives are worthless. So in psychology, we have this idea of unfreezing. Um, in social movement theory, they call this biographic availability. It's a personal um, psychology phenomenon, and it's a constellation of circumstances that can happen if um, somebody's life becomes appended. So the idea is that most of the time, we are moving along the tracks that are set up for us by the society, the expectations of people we love and respect, the threat of punishment from laws and, and just social, you know, social um, alienation if we do something wrong. Um, and we are kind of frozen in our actions. We do the right things and we don't do the wrong things, not because we really think about what's right and what's wrong, but rather because these tracks hold us in place. But what if you lose your family and your loved ones? What if you're fired from your job? What if the legal system becomes inept or your country is at war and everything is up in the air and the tracks just disappear? This is the moment of unfreezing when what's right and what's wrong and who's a friend and who's a foe is completely undetermined. In this state, we we find that people are vulnerable to joining radical groups such as religious cults or terrorist groups or gangs. They are prone to developing radical ideas. And my, my book and my talk today will demonstrate how for a lot of Americans this unfreezing happened not in their private lives but in the mass identity um, that they grew up with and held as a solid fact, but that became kind of fluid. And, and so they found themselves without a, um, without a map for what to do and what to think and whom to trust. And in particular, these four social domains that provide tracks for most of us. Um, so most Americans who are now QAnon followers started out thinking that the government is benevolent and trustworthy and that there is no dream but the American dream and Hollywood is its prophet. And starting in about 1990s, this previously solid fact just begun to disintegrate. It started with the sexual scandals of Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky and corruption scandals in Washington. And um, you know the latest incarnation of it was the Me Too uh, revelations about the decades-long sexual abuse of Hollywood um, stars and moguls that were covered up. So keep in mind, there was an actual conspiracy there, right, that had to do with sexual abuse of minors. Science. These people, like, like I did, grew up with the idea that science was the ultimate arbiter of truth. That was our best way at getting to what is true in the world. But little by little, we ended up in a place historically and culturally where science is how they get carcinogens into your food and how they get asbestos into baby formula. And science is how they develop drugs of addiction that they know very well will get people addicted in just one try. And yet they push them on people. And then these same scientists built treatment facilities so they can make money on both ends. 150,000 American lives lo lost to the opioid drug crisis. Not a single member of the Sackler family responsible for it has gone to jail. An actual conspiracy existed that became uncovered, and yet no justice, right? So the whole legal and judicial system failed a lot of people. 
religion used to be the moral authority. A lot of people grew up with that idea. But of course, since then, we've lived through the church sex scandal that started with the Catholic Church. And then it just ruled over every single denomination. The, um, the Jewish um, scandals in, in New York City, sex abuse, um, Islamic um, um, denominations, even Buddhist and, and yogic traditions have all been marred by decades long sex abuse against children that were covered up. Again, a conspiracy, an actual conspiracy. And finally, gender roles. I mean, if there was one thing we didn't have to worry about whether it's real or not, it was gender, right? You get a baby, it's either a boy or a girl. Now it's a fluid thing, right? It's an unfrozen social domain. We have to worry about pronouns. We have to worry about, uh, you know, homosexuals getting married to each other. It used to be marriage was between a man and a woman, and a lot of little girls grew up dreaming about their wedding day as this, you know, pivotal moment, the height of their life experience. And now it turns out it wasn't just for them. So all of these four domains became unfrozen. People felt very uncomfortable with this mutually shared reality that just disappeared and the alternative to which was pain, pleasure, and the starry heavens above. And at the same time, some other things happened. So we're going to talk about some other things that happened. Um, but just to give you a little background, um, in 2017, these posts appeared on obscure internet corners, these messengers, Q 4chan, 8chan, 8kun, that none of us actually typically use. Um, the posts were signed Q. Q stands for the highest level of government clearance, so it landed some gravitas to the claims that were made by these posts. Um, we now know that the people who are, are behind these posts probably have background in Cicada, which is this online gaming platform that is built like a puzzle. Um, and so they encouraged people to solve these puzzles um, and to do their own research to figure out the truth. They claimed they had the truth. Now, I already painted a picture for you. A lot of people were in search for truth and they rejected previous authorities on truth, and so they were looking for an alternative. And it's important, I think, to listen to how they talk about their discovery of QAnon. They use the terminology from the movie The Matrix, um, where the main character is this, uh, you know, coder, you probably know it, but he's, he's offered a choice um, because he feels that something is not quite right in the world. That's a quote. And he suspects that the world is, a, is an illusion should be familiar to you. And he encounters this, this character, Morpheus, who offers him a choice to either take the blue pill, which allows him to go back to his current reality, or take the red pill, which will shed the remainders of this illusion and allow him to see what is actually out there. And so that is the red pill. So QAnon talk about discovering this truth as taking the red pill, red pilling. Um, these are two examples of Q drops. There was a total of over 500 of these. I mean, I think it's important to see them just to understand how bizarre this phenomenon is. Because there is no rhyme or reason. If you've ever talked with a schizophrenic who's in, in delirium, they sound exactly like this. So you need to understand what these people were working with when they were finding the truth, okay? Um, and little by little, they started sharing their discoveries of the truth from these Q drops. And they ended up with this. Some of you will have seen, I think, two slides from this presentation yesterday. I apologize. Um, so QAnon is a collection of conspiracy theories that followers have uncovered um, that include the idea that the Earth is flat, that there are space lasers that burn California forests that are controlled by Jews, that um, there is the 5G towers spread radiation that's going to kill you, that uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton and a bunch of other um, famous Democratic politicians and, and Hollywood celebrities are part of a 
um, cabal uh, that you know worships the devil and kidnaps children to torture them and harvest the children's blood for adrenochrome, a chemical substance which they believe when injected gives the person some magic powers and that Donald Trump is secretly fighting behind the scenes to take down the cabal and bring them to justice and to restore America to its former glory. And this hashtag WWG1, WGA stands for when, where we go one, we go all. So it became a mass identity, not just a set of disjointed beliefs, but it became a collection of people who felt that they shared something important, a shared reality or shared illusion, depending on which side of, of this mirror you're on. Um, and I think it's important also to see the dynamics of QAnon following. So at first, from 2011 until COVID lockdowns began, there was very little increase in following over time. So from 2007 until about February 2020, you can hardly see any slope to the line, um, which represents the number of, of, of followings in, engaging with QAnon material. But then you see just a geometric progression of increase after the lockdowns began. Um, these data are from QAnon um, Instagram account, accounts, but we see identical pictures from Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, um, and so on every single social platform, the following or the, the amount of, of engagement and the number of individuals that participated in this meaning making went up precipitously just as state lockdowns began. So why is that important and relevant? Because I think in addition to these people um, already experiencing all kinds of unfreezing unpleasantness, the lockdowns put them in extreme isolation, which in itself we know from experimental research that when we put people in isolation, we make them feel like nobody loves them. We make them feel alienated. In the absence of any previous connection to QAnon, an average person will become more accepting of conspiracy beliefs. So isolation and alienation are causal factors for conspiracy beliefs. But at the same time, also, we were all having all kinds of emotions during COVID um, epidemic and lockdowns, right? We didn't know what the future was going to be like. We didn't know if we were going to get sick. We didn't know if we were going to live through it. We didn't know if any of our loved ones were going to get sick or if they were going to live through it. Were we going to lose our jobs? Were they going to be there at all? What the world was going to look like? And when is this going to be over? All of those questions produced a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, and a lot of uncertainty. And again, from psychology research, completely unrelated to conspiracy theories of QAnon, we know that those emotions in themselves, anxiety, fear, and uncertainty, will lead people to embrace radical ideas and will lead people to consider and endorse conspiracy beliefs. This is independent of QAnon. This is pre-QAnon research, right? So it was actually kind of like a perfect storm that created this massive following of people who became QAnon followers. And I think it's important to consider all of these different emotions that brought people to the internet in the first place looking for answers. They were feeling disgusted at the government that was just doing horrible things with impunity. They were feeling angry at the government that betrayed their trust. They were feeling fearful and anxious about science that was, you know, in their food, in their medicine, and they had very little understanding of it and zero control of it. Um, they were also feeling distrust and outraged toward organized religion. We have these data from before QAnon on the hills of the sexual um, um, abuse scandal in the church. And they were feeling anxiety and loneliness, some of them, about the shifting gender norms about the inclusion of, of gay and, and um, lesbian and trans people into the normative uh, rights of our society. And so they went online and 
like I also have to say, it's important to understand that the algorithms on these platforms that prioritized uh, content that brought users and engaged users over a long time um, recommended very quickly. So if you um, did a legitimate search for, let's say, Donald Trump presidential candidate, in three or four clicks, you would end up with QAnon content. Same thing if you did a search about COVID or about vaccines, in three or four clicks, there's research on that, YouTube or Facebook would bring into your selection items that were QAnon related. And so very quickly, people who came to the internet searching for answers and searching for companionship, right? Because they were isolated and lonely and anxious. Very quickly, they found QAnon. And what did QAnon do for them? Well, it turns out it did a lot. Because solving these puzzles about how the world actually works gave them a sense of superiority. They were so much better than all these rubes that still trusted the government and science. They knew how it really was. It gave them pride. And so it, is, it satisfied a need for, for cognitive competency. The fact that there were other people at any time, day or night, literally at the flick of the finger, who shared their ideas, who you can vent to about your frustrations and anger, gave them a sense of social connection that they really needed. They could express their outrage about things that they couldn't really talk about in polite company, about gay marriage and about you know, trans kids you know, getting surgeries and um, about the education that our government is indoctrinating our kids with. They found a community of like-minded others where outrage was not only okay, but it was encouraged. And so it shared, it offered some sort of an emotional outlet that they were really grateful for. And finally, it gave them actually a sense of purpose and a meaning in their lives, which they often kind of lacked when the American dream, you know, showed its ugly side. A lot of people felt like their life was going nowhere. They were working day and night. They were barely making ends meet. They were not important to the government. They were not important to the church. Everybody was lying to them. Everybody was just swindling them out of money. But here, they could fight the cabal. They could help take down the pedophiles. They could save the children. That was the hashtag that became really popular. They could go to the demonstration and express these opinions in public. And so QAnon actually did for them what the government and science and religion didn't do for them. Now, after January 6th, when you know, QAnon came on the radar of a lot of people that it wasn't on the radar before, and you know, um, it became equivalent with the insurrection attempt, although it's not. Most people at the at January 6th storming of the Capitol Hill were not QAnon followers. Um, but of course, QAnon followers were the most visible. And so the salience of these Q signs on their flags and their insignia became the signifier for the event. Um, and it became stigmatized and it became, um, you know, kind of also earth shattering for them because the prophecy was that there was going to be the storm and that Donald Trump was going to come into power and they were there to help it happen. And then it didn't. So the prophecy failed. Donald Trump didn't so much as speak out in their defense when they were being arrested and rounded up. The, um, the Q drops stopped actually before the election. Q stopped posting in October of that year. And so there was no explanation. There was no alternative conspiracy theory. They, they tried for a while to come up with, with, uh, with their own, such as that Joe Biden was actually Donald Trump in a bodysuit or that uh, you know, the, the Joe, Joe Biden presidency was like filmed for the Rubes to be running on TV, but Donald Trump was actually president, you know, where we're just showing this picture to those people who are not in the know. But in reality, Donald Trump is running um, the, the, the show. But at the same time, this fracture happened where some people defected from QAnon and realized that this was a big lie and they were yet again, you know, led along a wrong path. And some of them became very vocal um, spokespeople against QAnon. Um, some people started doubting. Um, and 
they were very quickly, a lot of them picked up by right-wing radical groups who um, made it a point to reach out to these QAnon followers who were now again in the state of unfreezing. And they realized we have these communications from right-wing militia groups like Proud Boys and Oath Keepers who were saying this is the ripe time to go and pick these QAnon followers and tell them what's really real, you know? So they were going to present to them yet again um, a different idea of reality, not like QAnons. But then there were also some diehards that remain in the camp, firmly believing that, you know, we just don't know what the truth is and actually, you know, Joe Biden didn't swear on the Bible. It was a different book that was wrapped in a cover that looked like the Bible, but he actually was not sworn in as president. The, the mental gymnastics that go into to explain it is mind boggling. To put some numbers on it, this is from um, national polls of about 80,000 people um, in, I believe, February of 2021, which found that 17% of American adults believe in the central tenets of QAnon. So 17% believe that there is a cabal of Satan worshiping pedophiles, da, 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 Donald Trump is fighting them. 17% of American adults is about 45 million people. Okay? Um, there, uh, additional 37% are not quite sure. So we would put them in the doubters category. So I, like, do you think there is a cabal? Eh, maybe, I don't know. Um, so these are scary numbers. I've seen different numbers, so just to put down the lowest boundary that I've seen from a good, large, representative national polls is 5% of true believers, which is still 15 million American adults. So it's massive. And to make things worse, it's global. So QAnon followers are not just Americans. We have QAnon followers in Canada. We have a lot of them in Australia. Um, we have them, a lot of them in South America. They really believe that, that stuff. Um, it, the, the story is different um, for the, the, on, the, on the European side of the continent because here Russia took over the narrative, Russia took over the narrative and for example, you know, instead of Hillary Clinton, who is not really on the radar for a lot of Europeans as a politician, um, they have like uh, Rockefeller as the leader of the cabal. And instead of the Chinese lab, which was the culprit for QAnon, for QAnon in America uh, in developing uh, um, coronavirus, in, in the Russian version of, of QAnon narrative, it's the NATO labs in Ukraine and Georgia and I think Kyrgyzstan that developed NATO labs in Ukraine, Georgia and Kyrgyzstan that developed um, COVID as a biological weapon. Um, what else can be said about QAnon? Is it a terrorist group? Um, which after January 6th, a lot of mass media just openly compared it with ISIS and Al Qaeda, and some of our colleagues did as well. And I don't think it is uh, for a number of reasons. You know, it's, it's a grassroots movement um, they don't have a shared intention. You know, they don't have plans to bomb this place or, you know, stage that or, you know, the ideology is very a la carte. So you can pick and choose, but you, you don't have to subscribe to the whole set of beliefs. You can just, you know, if you like lizard people, you can go with that, you know. Um, and just the sheer number of followers, you know, 15 million, million people can't really be considered a terrorist group. It's more like a social movement. Um, and just to give you an idea of how much uh, danger QAnon carries, so out of you know, this upper boundary estimate of about 30 million people in America with radical views, how many ideological crimes were committed by QAnon followers? That is crimes that were conducted in the name of their QAnon beliefs. The answer is about 100. 100 individuals carried out ideologically motivated crimes. So it's a rate of one out of 300,000 believers who actually do anything radical. So all in all, it's not dangerous in the sense that a terrorist group is dangerous. It's dangerous in a different way. Um, yeah, just for comparison, so you know, we spent 20 years fighting Islamic terrorism in the United States. 
we have about 70,000 American Muslims there uh, who hold radical Islamist views. This is from representative polls of American Muslims that I've conducted for five years repeatedly for Department of Homeland Security. And also about 100 individuals, American Muslims, were charged with terrorist-related offenses. So you can see the difference in the, in the rate of radical action out of a group with radical beliefs. Is QAnon a mental health issue? Why is it even relevant? Because very early on it became clear that the rates of previously diagnosed mental health issues among QAnon followers are magnitudes greater than they are among a um, sample of representative American um, adults, which is this last bar. So 20% for an average American adult, chances are that that person had a history of mental health diagnoses versus 68% of, hist of history of mental health diagnosis among QAnon followers who stormed um, the Capitol Hill on January 6th and 58% among about 100 QAnon followers um, on whom I did case studies personally. So mental health is a big factor. The causality direction is hard to determine. It's possible that people who are already mentally unwell see these Q drops, and you've seen them, and they just feel like this is their mothership, you know? Um, and so it could be a self-selection thing. It also could be that following them co this content, as they do day and night, these people become obsessed. They, they go down the rabbit hole, that's the term they used, and they spend just hours and hours, day and night, they neglect their own children to save the children, some fictional children online, and spending all this time with content that's very disturbing. You know, they're talking about torture of children, like graphically describing it, that that in itself can trigger any dormant psychopathology or even, you know, maybe in some cases develop it when it was never there to begin with. Um, but it's, it's a major factor. Um, we know for a fact that this is, this is um, my survey of about 500 Americans where I asked them about eight different QAnon conspiracies, how much they believed each. each. This include, uh, included the lizard people idea, flat earth, space lasers, um, COVID is a hoax, COVID vaccine is a tracking device, Donald Trump is, is fighting the cabal, um, you know, Jews have taken over the mass media. So eight uh, of these things, turns out there is a, a, you know, the internal correlation among these items is rather high, so you can put them into one scale and you get this conspiracy belief scale. And this conspiracy belief scale correlates with support for Capitol Hill riot. So if I ask people, how do you feel about the January 6th event? And the options I give them are, um, I would never do that myself and I don't support people who did it, to all the way to, uh, I admire people who did it and I would join them if I could. The more people believe in conspiracy theories of QAnon, the more support they express for the January 6th insurrection and the people who carried it out. Conspiracy beliefs is a uh, measure is also correlated with a measure of radical intention. So, okay, conspiracy beliefs, radicalism, very high correlation. In social sciences, like we're happy with correlations in the teens. Correlation in the 40s is incredibly high. So if a person believes that they're lizard people and they're space lasers and the earth is flat, they're very likely to also say, I would join a protest if I knew it was gonna turn violent. I would attack police or security forces if I saw them beating um, you know, my, my uh, side of the protest. So radical intention is predicted by conspiracy beliefs. Um, what's more, um, I did a survey of about uh, 250 random Americans online to ask them whether they knew anybody who believed in QAnon. And I was going to originally contrast with a dedicated group for QAnon survivors online, you know, whose family broken up because, you know, one of their family members became a QAnon follower and they were grieving this and they created a support group. So I was going to contrast their data with the data of these random people who I didn't expect, you know, had very many QAnon um, family members. And to my huge surprise, 
80% of respondents knew somebody who was a QAnon followers. And what's more, out of these 80% of respondents, the majority knew a family member. It was either you know, their immediate family or a distant family, which means that this was a person that they've known their whole lives. It's not like you know, somebody they, they, they met while walking the dog. It's somebody that they've known for a long time who turned to QAnon. And when I asked them how it made them feel, you know, um, after their loved one became a QAnon follower, you see that these people are not QAnon believers. I asked them, right? You see that a lot of them felt very angry. So this is a midpoint of the scale where I asked them about anger. And the majority of respondents, more than 50%, say that it made them feel either extremely uh, more angry or a lot more angry. So. The radicalization that created QAnon produced a radicalization on the other side, which is what typically happens. Radicalization happens to both sides. But the anger of these people is a marker of radicalization. And so if you compare people who had, oh, sorry, I meant to press a different button. Um, people who had a QAnon loved one with people who didn't have a QAnon loved one, you find that those who had a QAnon family member or friend felt a lot more anxiety and a lot more PTSD than those who didn't. So not only do these people feel a lot angrier than they had before, but they develop psychological problems because of somebody that they know developing QAnon identity and QAnon beliefs. Um, and when I asked them about you know, their own radicalization, how likely are you to um, like, yeah, I asked them first about, about their own radicalization. Um, how likely are you to support a group that fights for your political and legal rights, even if that organization sometimes resorts to violence? And you see that most of respondents say they would never. You know, more than 50% fall on the lower side of the scale. But then I asked them, how about QAnon followers? Do you think they would continue supporting QAnon even if that group um, turned to violence? And then they say that the majority of QAnon followers, they think the majority would do so. So they perceive QAnon as very dangerous. And these are people who actually know a QAnon loved one. So not only are they anxious and angry, they're also kind of fearful. And I want you to reflect back on how you felt when you envisioned the idea that all of these realities were shared are not as solid as we are used to imagining them. And I want you to now think that these people who had a QAnon loved ones had a snapshot of that when the person they knew their whole life all of a sudden was telling them that the science they know is wrong, the government they respect is not an authority, that they were going to take it upon themselves to change you know, the country and make it what they believe is the right reality. So these people also have been to a degree unfrozen. Um, this is a, an image from the matrix, right? So the truth is out there kind of thing. Um, and I want to end with the idea that any shared illusion, and I don't mean illusion dismissively, I mean, they're beautiful illusions that we share. You know, beauty is a beautiful thing that we agree on. Um, it stops working when we stop sacrificing for it. Making sacrifices is the only currency that gives meaning to any idea. A marriage stops working when partners stop sacrificing for it. A collective meaning of any sort cracks and crumbles when it's not supported by real sweat and real tears however great that meaning once was. And so I think in order for us to move forward from the QAnon unfreezing or any version of it, we have to reconsider what are we sacrificing for the reality that we don't want to disappear? What are we sacrificing for the values that we hold sacred, dear, important? Thank you.